that together one more time. You are we make miracle work. Promise keep. Come on, last time as loud as you can. You are we make. amazing. What a great way to start the day. And we want to welcome you to Heritage Church. I know that you could have gone anywhere or tuned in to any place, but thank you for being here. Uh, we want to welcome you. My name is Chris Zarba, and I am one of the pastors here. And I just want to go ahead and say, you guys look great today. Thank you. Yeah. Except that guy in the third row. He actually looks sort of terrible. Like he's just gotten out of bed. Come on, man. Ever heard of a comb? <laughs> All right. So listen, if you're here today and uh, you're brand new especially, we would love for you to take a minute and fill out the connection card. Uh, it's as simple as taking out your smartphone, scanning the QR code on the seat in front of you, or if you're online, click the connect button and take just 30 seconds and we will send you a free gift if you're brand new and today is your first time here. We believe that you can stay connected as you want to be. We would love for you to take a second and fill that out for us because that would be great. I know none of these people are going to fill it out. Look at them. They're barely paying attention. You know, it's always the 1030 service that's the worst. They all just want to come to the popular service. You know, it's not a social club, people. So anyway, um, you probably heard us promoting the last several months, actually, like almost like eight weeks, that we have the big event of the summer coming up, Jimmy John's, just in two weeks. So we're going to let Kristen and Kyle tell you about it. So take just a second and watch this. You're invited to the event of the summer, Heritage at Jimmy John's Field on July 23rd. You can expect a fun and engaging service with live music, a life-changing message, giveaways, fun for the whole family, and so much more. So we will be ending the service celebrating life change through baptisms. The service starts at 11 a.m., but doors open at 10 o'clock for fun. This is going to be something that you're not going to want to miss. Invite a friend or two, a family member, a neighbor. We are really excited for this. Jimmy John Field on July 23rd. So I don't know about you, but I love the idea of coming together in one service. Uh, if, if, if on a given Sunday, if all three services attended this one large service, and then everybody who tunes, tunes in online on any given Sunday, we would have over 4,000 people uh, at one service. That would be incredible. So uh, it's going to be, yeah, it's going to be a fun time. So we would love for you to come out and just be a part of it. It's going to be epic. And uh, don't come here because this place will be empty. Make sure you go over there. And if you've been a person who's trusted Christ and you've never been baptized and you've made that decision, especially recently, please sign up for baptism. Uh, and sign up today. Please make it sooner rather than later. I know these people. <laughs> They're going to wait to sign up the night before or the day of, like they always do. All right, and so then we have an announcement about kids camp. Uh, this is coming up the first week of August. If you have a kid between uh, kindergarten and the fifth grade, you know, or maybe your child is already registered, bring a friend, and I'm telling you, that's going to be completely epic. It's called Camp Out, and you can go to uh, heritagechurch.com slash events and find that and register today. And I've got to tell you, we can't wait to see your wonderful, easy-to-deal-with children. I'm not touching that. No way. <laughs> no way. So, hey, listen, you've arrived for part number three of a four-part series called Diary of a Secret Sinner. And if you haven't figured it out by now, today we're talking about judging others. All right, is being judgmental. And, and so today we have Jeff Forrester here with us today. He's a you know, he's a great speaker. It's gonna be a wonderful message. Of course, it would be a lot better if I were speaking today. <laughs> But hey, I guess he's good enough. Have you ever walked up to people and realized they were just talking about you? 
Have you ever had it happen 60 times in a row? I have. People take one look at me and go, ah, help, run! A big, stupid, ugly ogre. <sighs> they judge me before they even know me. How much is this? I don't think this would fit you. Well, I didn't ask if it would fit. I asked how much it was. How much is this, Marie? It's very expensive. It's very expensive. Look, I got money to spend in here. I don't think we have anything for you. You're obviously in the wrong place. Please leave. All them fellas that used to belittle me, not a single one of them were curious. You know, they thought they had everything all figured out, and so they judged everything, and they judged everyone. Day. Yeah, of course. All right, well, I'll let you know what day is, right? All right. Good afternoon. I'm Jeff Forster. I'm one of the past year, pastors here, and I'm going to admit to you, I feel a little judged today. Uh, Zarba up here. Well, hey, we're in a message series called um, A Diary of a Secret Center, and we weren't really sure how this was going to go as far as how people would receive it, but man, it's been amazing, right? Uh, on the front end, it kind of, ooh, do I even want to get engaged with this? But on the back end, some people are saying this has been really challenging. I feel like I, I want to be a better person. I feel like these are, are really practical messages. And so uh, I hope that you'll engage. If you missed last week, Zarba uh, uh, spoke on pride because we felt like he was the most qualified, uh, most skilled at it. <laughs> Um, <laughs> he literally told us, I'm kind of a big deal. If you missed it, you got to go watch that, go watch that, that uh, service online. The week before that was uh, Dave Wilson, and he did a great job uh, talking about compromise. And uh, I just feel like, man, if you missed it, go back and watch. These are going to be challenging, sure, but they're going to be really, really encouraging. And today, uh, I'm the one that gets to talk about who's to judge, because I'm the most qualified to talk about not being judgmental. <clears throat> Uh, so there's that. So we better pray, invite the Lord to help us in this mess, and then we'll, uh, we'll go forward. God, we thank you for loving us, and we thank you for challenging us, for giving us your word that gives us a better way to live. And so I just pray that our hearts will be open to what your spirit has to say to us today, and that we would leave uh, deciding to become a little bit more like Jesus in the way that we uh, treat others. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So uh, a little while ago, a couple years ago, I, it was my 50th birthday, and um, uh, I wasn't really thinking about it. It was maybe the week before my birthday, something like that, and uh, my daughter comes to me, and she's always late, always, always late. She's 19 years old. She's always late. Uh, I don't remember her ever being on time, to be honest with you, and so I kind of passed judgment on that just a little bit, and then I get on her about it because I'm, I'm very prompt. That's the one thing, I'm rarely late. If I'm late, I probably have a body part hanging off of me or there was a car accident in front of me. Something happened. I just, I hate, 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 hate being late. So uh, I was supposed to have a meeting. My wife uh, told me, she said, hey, you have a meeting over at the church and uh, um, uh, you need to be there by, I forgot, it was a weird time, like 5.30 or something. And I didn't want to go to the meeting, but she scheduled it and I said, okay, I'll do it. So then uh, B uh, Jenna, Bonnie had Jenna's car. So Jenna uh, said, hey, I need to go over to the church and get my car. It's at the parking lot. 
and uh, I need to ride with you. I said, okay. I said, well, I got to leave at, at you know, a certain time, 5.15 or whatever. And she said, okay. Well, then she comes out. She's doing her makeup stuff. I'm like, come on, come on, I got to go. I'm going to leave if you're not ready to go. Come on, let's go, let's go. And she was like, well, I'll be right with you in just a second. And finally, she comes out, and she's getting her makeup just right, her hair done. I'm like, you're picking up your car. Come on, let's go. And uh, so we get in the car, and now at this point, I'm late. I'm going to be late for this meeting. I didn't know these people. I'm really frustrated. And I started laying into her. I said, you know, this is what you do. You do this a lot, Jenna. And I said, I'm not trying to be a jerk. I'm just saying, hey, there's people uh, waiting on us, expecting us. And, and for me personally, you're going to ruin my reputation because you're the one who chooses to always be late. You know, if you can be 15 minutes late every single time, you could just start everything 15 minutes earlier and be on time. You know that, right? And she's just taking it all the way here. And then we get out of the car, I go in, I grab a Coke. I said, where's your mom? She goes, I don't know. And so I, I walk into the, the commons area in the office, and everybody goes, surprise! And it was my birthday, and they had a surprise birthday party for me. And I've been judging my daughter for a 12-minute drive all the way over to the church from our house. And uh, yeah, I'm that guy sometimes. I think... Uh, Oh, they were just making fun of me again today, saying uh, I'm very, uh, my, my wife and my daughter are going, yeah, this is the message you should talk about. <laughs> so I'm preaching to me as much as I am to you today. But I think that all of us have either witnessed a time where we judged or prejudged a situation thinking we know, or we've judged a person, or we were, unju- or we were judged unfairly by others. I think this is a universal thing. I think it's every culture, it's every country, every generation. It happens inside and outside the church. It happens everywhere. Unfortunately, I think the church has gotten kind of a bad rap for this a little bit. And uh, uh, maybe one of the most famous comments along these lines is the uh, uh, interview that was done. uh, Dr. J.H. Holmes did an interview. It was published in a Harvard periodical with... um, uh, with Mahatma Gandhi back in the early 20th century. And he summarized this series of interviews by saying, here's the summary of it, that basically what Gandhi was saying was, I like your Christ, but I don't like your Christians. Your Christians are so unlike your Christ. That's a really powerful statement, isn't it? That's a big thing. He's like, I really like that Jesus guy. He loves people. Jesus spoke the truth. He did, but he spoke it in love. And sometimes we speak the truth and forget the love side of it, right? So he's, man, I love the Jesus guy. I'm not upset by the things he says, but man, the way Christians treat other people sometimes isn't the best. And so I think that there's a tension there that you and I have to live with, understanding that there is truth and grace. Jesus is confronted with this woman that was caught in adultery, and they want to kill her. Jesus, finally, uh, after he says, you know, he that has no sin cast the first stone, they leave. The, the, the accusers wanted to stone her to death, and then they leave when he says that. And she goes, he goes, woman, where are your accusers? She said, I have none. And he goes, neither do I accuse you. Now go and sin no more. He called it sin. He let her know what it was, but he spoke to her the truth in love, right? And, and I think that that's the balance. That's the challenge. And so if you're a first-time person with us today online or here in the room, if you're, if you're a person that's not yet sure about this Christianity thing, you picked a great day to kind of look behind the curtain, to peek under the hood a little bit as we really kind of challenge one another with this idea of how do we judge the way Jesus would judge without being judgmental. And that really is the trick. I think uh, most Christians' intent is good. I, I, I don't think most Christians intend to be judgmental people. They don't, they don't intend to, right? Man, they just love Jesus, and they believe that God's word really matters, and that God shows us the best way to live, and, and they believe that if you could just know the love and the hope and the peace and the joy that they've experienced and find out how God will transform your lives, it'll be great for you too. And so I think the intent is usually pretty good the majority of the time. But sometimes the execution isn't so great. And we begin to develop habits that can hurt other people. And so our goal today is to sort out the difference between judge and judgmental. As a matter of fact, we're going to kind of define, actually culturally we're going to redefine the word, but we're going to define what Jesus meant because there's, there's two things. Have you ever heard a person quote before, you know, it's the only verse in the whole Bible most people know, is uh, judge not, that you be not judged. You ever hear somebody quote that verse? It's in Matthew chapter 7. We'll actually read it today. 
Um, so there's, there's that. Jesus said, don't judge lest you be judged. And at the same time, Jesus told us we're supposed to judge. And then Paul tells us we're supposed to judge. So the question isn't always um, uh, what or whatever. It's, it's who. And I think that this is the big issue. We misuse and we misinterpret the word judge a lot. We, we guess what we think the Bible is supposed to mean. And then we live in a cancel culture that thinks that all judging, especially anything where you tell them that you disagree with them, that's pure evil. Uh, now, it's not bad when they judge you. It's just bad when you judge them. And so it kind of goes right. You've heard people say, don't judge me, or you're judging me, or you're supposed to endorse and agree with everything that I do and everything I believe and all my behaviors. And we see this in movies and we see it in sitcoms all the time. Funny thing is that sometimes people respond this way to the good kind of of uh, advice and challenge and judging as well as the bad. And so I think there's a real consequence to not, if we don't take the time to think it through, to work through what the Bible has to say, to reconcile the two sides of this issue, um, we can wind up, if we can't figure out the difference between judging and being judgmental, um, one is okay and the other is not, and there are certain consequences or uh, 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 circumstances that work. I think the consequences, if we don't sort this out, we'll hurt ourselves, we'll hurt other people, we can hurt the cause of Christ and God's kingdom moving forward in the world around us. And so uh, I want to really take um, uh, some verses in the Bible and unpack those big ideas because here's what we know we know that Jesus said, don't judge and judge. We know that Paul told us. There's judge on the inside, but don't judge on the outside. And so the big question is, uh, what is the Bible conflicted with itself? What's the, what's the deal here? So I, let, let me define this first. I'm going to say the statement. Because we haven't defined judging yet, it's going to sound weird. I'm going to read a verse, then we'll define it, okay? So Christians are never called to judge outsiders, but we are called to judge insiders, when the, the verse we're going to read in a minute differentiates between those people that are in the family of God, the believers that follow Jesus and are supposed to be living the Jesus lifestyle and uh, have placed their faith and trust in Jesus, and those that are not in the family of God, they, they have not uh, embraced following Jesus as their Savior. And so the Bible tells us not to judge those that are on the outside, but to judge those that are on the inside. The Bible doesn't tell us never to judge, the Bible just tells us who to judge. So uh, here, let's, let's look at this. First Corinthians chapter 5. Now, the whole chapter. You should read the whole chapter. You, it's legal. You can do it if you want to. Uh, and you're of age. You're of age. We can trust you with a Bible. So download it. It's a free Bible. If you want to steal one from the lobby, you can have one out there in the lobby. We'll give them to you for free. Um, uh, read all of 1 Corinthians chapter 5. He unpacks this big problem that's going on, and there's some really bad sin in the church, and nobody wants to do anything about it because they don't want to come off judgmental. And here's what Paul says. It isn't my responsibility to judge outsiders. But it certainly is your responsibility to judge those inside the church who are sinning. God will judge those on the outside. So he says you're supposed to judge people on the inside, but not on the outside. And here's, here's the reason why. Why would I ever expect someone to keep the standards and beliefs of something that they never even signed up for? The, the Bible says that when you place your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, you're a part of God's very own family. Uh, at one point, God says, I'll be like a father to you. You'll be like my children, my sons and daughters to me. Uh, another place he said that he always planned to adopt you into his very own family. The Bible says to those who believed him and received him, he gave the power to become the children of God. We can go on and on and on. The, the family metaphor in the Bible is very strong. That's how God views the church, those people who claim to be Christians and followers of Jesus. So there's people inside of your family, and then there's people outside of your family. Is that true? Is that true? So you have some people in your family, some people are outside your family. Why would we think we had the right to impose our family rules on people who aren't part of the family? Does it make any sense? This is what he's talking about here. So uh, uh, when, we were, when, when our kids were growing up, uh, we had the forced, some forster family rules. We had specific rules. Uh, did, did you have any family rules for your kids, for your family, when you were growing up or when your kids were growing up? Sure, we all did. Uh, maybe, maybe you had family time, family rules about what time bedtime is. Uh, uh, now, did you go around and make sure all the other children in the neighborhood were in bed at the same time your family rules were to be in bed? 
No, of course not. Maybe you have rules about uh, no screens at the dinner table. Hey, that seems like a good rule, right? Let's be present with the people we're with. How about that for a minute? Uh, so let's say, hey, we have that rule, no screens at the, at the dinner table. But now let's say that your neighbor invites you over for a barbecue at his place. So you're just hanging out. You're going to eat the, the, the meat that he just barbecued, and you're going to sit around and enjoy time, you and your family. Next thing you know, his phone buzzes. He reaches in. He pulls out his phone, check his email real quick. You go, hey, wait, wait, wait. We have a rule about no screens at the dinner table. Does that make any sense? You're a guest at his house. It's, it's not your house. It's not your family. So guess what? It's not your family rules. This is kind of what Paul is differentiating between is there's a difference between saying, hey, we need to enforce the family rules with the family and we have no business trying to impose our family rules on everybody else. So we should judge on the inside. We shouldn't judge on the outside. Now, when we use the word judge, you've been conditioned to believe judge means judgmental. So we have to unsort that piece as well. Um, and we will in just a second. So we we're trying to figure out how to make this memorable, how to keep this together. We teach in a teaching team kind of a format, and uh, Zarbaugh kind of helps us take the lead on that. And so this is his phrase, not mine, but I'm going to read it. He said, judge the believing, not the heathen. <laughs> That's so judgmental. Just calling somebody a heathen is judgmental, but it's a memorable statement, right? So we judge those that are on the inside, not those that are on the outside. Uh, so if you don't like that, I didn't say it. I only read what he wrote. And if you want to complain, it's czarbaugh at heritagechurch.com. He'll be in the lobby after the service, so go, go talk to him. So there's a major difference between judging and judgmental. Let me, let me define these two ideas. Judging is to help determine right behavior between wrong behavior and right behavior based on God's word, not on our opinion. So truth must be offered with grace. Let me read that again. Judging, biblical judging, is to help determine right behavior from wrong behavior based on God's word, not our opinion. Truth must be offered with grace. This is what judging means. So what's the job of a judge besides the sentencing? We think of sentencing first, but that's not his main job. His main job is to know the law and then determine is the behavior being presented before him in court is that, or her uh, in court, is that within the bounds of the law or outside the bounds of the law? Is that good behavior or bad behavior? That's what a judge does, right? So that in and of itself, it, it, try going to court and tell a judge, quit being so judgmental. Right? And he'd be, I'm not being judgmental. I have to judge. My job is to sort out right and wrong. That's, that's all the word judge in the Bible means. So that's the first side of it. And the key then, if we're going to go biblical, is to understand it's not my opinion that determines what's right and wrong because everybody has a different opinion. Instead, what does God's word say? And then in that context, we decide what's right or wrong. But we have to do it with truth and grace. The key is to make a follower of Christ feel challenged yet loved. To be convicted, perhaps, for sin, yet cared for. While being directed toward biblical truth, we do it with grace. There's this balance. Jesus spoke the truth in love. He came with grace and truth, the Bible says. There's always this balance to the way that Jesus did things. That's what we have to do. There's a difference between judging, just sorting out what's right and what's wrong based on what God says, and being judgmental. Being judgmental is to put someone down because of their behavior based on our opinion and not on God's word, especially giving aggressive correction without grace. That's really the balance there. And that can be really a, a hard balance between being judgmental, putting somebody down uh, because of their behavior uh, based on our opinions, rather than uh, uh, encouraging somebody to do the right thing based on uh, what God's word has to say. So, so let me sort this out just a little bit for you. So um, how many of you would agree that it would be, uh, that the Bible says you should not steal? How many of you agree? If the person next to you didn't raise their hand, you might want to check your wallet real quick. Um, <laughs> Okay, so let's say I had a friend. Let's say I had a friend who came to me and goes, hey, Jeff, you know I've been struggling with finances. Uh, yeah, I've been, I know you've been struggling with finances. So I worked out a deal, man. I figured it out. I figured out I can score 100 grand just robbing this bank. That'd be great. What do you think? You love me, right? You want what's best for me, right? And I'd be like, uh, <laughs> I don't think that'd be best. Why are you being so judgmental? Right? Well, you know, 
especially if they're Christian. Well, this, this should apply to everybody, I would say, but especially if they're Christian. Well, you know, God says don't steal. And if you steal, there's going to be consequences. You're going to ruin your life if you get caught doing this, right? Don't, don't steal. That's not the right way to do it. God says don't steal. And I love you enough to not co-sign. What, some, sometimes people want to bring their sin or their sinful lifestyle to you and want you to co-sign, it's okay. When God says, it's not okay. I'm not being judgmental when I speak to a Christian and go, God says no. I love you enough to say you're going to ruin your life if you do what God says no about. Does that make sense? At that point, I'm not being judgmental, but I want to speak the truth in love. I want to be kind about it. Um, uh, rather than being aggressive, like, I always knew you'd waste your life, throw your life away. I've always questioned your character anyways, right? That would be being judgmental. But so we have to sort between what is right and wrong, and we're not choosing that based on what society says, but what God's word says. And then we speak the truth to those that are inside the church with love. That's, That's what he's telling us. In John chapter 13... Verse 35, he says, by this, everyone will know that you're my disciples. Watch, watch, watch very closely. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you make sure everybody keeps all the rules. Is that what he says? No. Jesus did say, if you love me, keep my commandments. He did say that, John 10, 10. But in this passage, he says, everyone will know that you're my disciples if you, what? Love one another. So, uh, does he expect us to follow his commands? Absolutely. If you love me, keep my commandments. But, he says, everybody will know that you're my followers if you love one another. There's a place in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 13 where the Apostle Paul writes, and he's, it's the love chapter. We usually read it uh, in weddings and things, but it's not a wedding passage. It's just it's a beautiful passage about love in general. But he goes, um, in, 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 he says, hey, listen, you could have so much faith that you could move mountains. You could understand all the mysteries of God and be able to explain the whole Bible. But if you don't have love, you're nothing. That's the word he uses, nothing. That's extraordinary. You understand, you could have so much faith, you could do miracles. You could know so much Bible, you could win every single uh, uh, Bible trivia contest in the world. You know your theology frontwards and backwards. You're just brilliant as a theologian. But if you don't have love at the core of everything you do, you get a zero on your scorecard. That's what the word nothing means. Literally, the, the, the score would be zero. Isn't that amazing? So love is not just an important thing. Love is the most important thing when it comes time to speak the truth. We should, when love demands, speak the truth. We should always stand with God's truth, but we should always do it in a loving way. And I think that this is the most difficult thing, especially on social media. Man, social media is so hard. Uh, you, ever, you ever go down one of those rabbit holes where you just think, oh, I wonder, you read an article and then you go, I wonder what somebody says about this. Next thing you know, it's 25,000 either hysterically funny comments or monstrous comments, right? People just get so mean sometimes. And here's one of the issues. I think it's become a habit in our culture a little bit. Uh, we've gotten accustomed to not talking or not meeting, and we've gotten accustomed to just typing real quick. It's easier there's no real consequence to it. You can just fire off an angry, let it go, and nobody's going to punch you in the mouth right then. You know what I mean? And so you go, oh, hey, there's almost no consequences. I can do this. I hide behind my screen, and I'm not going to get in trouble or hurt or nothing, right? And so sometimes we do that. Now, I think most of the time, the good human beings among us, you don't intend to be offensive, but sometimes we're offensive, aren't we? Sometimes we say things. Um, here's why. Over 90% of all communication is nonverbal. Did you know that? Almost 90, so they say 93% uh, of all communication is nonverbal. That's why I've got like 15 people right here watching me face to face and all the rest of you are watching the screen because I'm so pretty, right? Because, and, and that's why we talk with our hands because we're trying to communicate more than those limited words can do. And that's why we raise our eyebrows and we smile while we're giving people bad news about being judgmental, right? And, 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 and we're engaging, we're making eye contact, eye contact and I'm making sure that the tone of my voice is friendly, right? That's what we do. That, isn't that what you do when, when you're talking? And so you're picking up on the visual and the audio uh, clues to know whether or not this is a dangerous thing or a good thing, whether this is beneficial or hurtful, 
whether this is going to be something where this person's coming trying to hurt me or this is a person who's trying to help me, right? The visual. But what happens is there is no tone built in online. There's no tone built in on your phone and texts, is there? So you know what? You read that text with the tone in your own head, not with the tone they meant. A while back, this is quite a while ago, uh, I've already told, admitted a couple times I'm not a very good Christian, so I'll just keep going with that one. Uh, uh, a while back, I, I came into the office a little late uh, in the morning. I had a lot I needed to do. I knew I was going to be working a little later. My wife works here in the office, and so uh, she pops in. It's a, you know, 15, 20 minutes after 5. She goes, hey, uh, uh, so we have the whole evening together. Uh, for, well, we have the whole evening free, so how much longer are you going to be? I'm like... And she interrupted some work I was doing. Sometimes when I get really laser focused, I, I get pulled out of it and I'm not the most pleasant person. So I got pulled over and I went, I don't know. Uh, I came a little late, probably, I don't know, maybe 45 minutes or so. And she goes, oh, okay, great. Just checking, want to see what we're going to do for dinner. And so she leaves. And she says, see you at home. I said, okay. Well, then rate 45 minutes on the dot. Ding, my phone dings while I'm working. Hey, just check and see what your plans are for dinner. And I'm like, just check and see what your plans are for dinner. <laughs> right? I'm like, jeez. Uh, I'll do what I want to do, woman. <laughs> right? That's, a, that's how I start to feel. I'm like, why is she nagging me, man? And so I got this work to finish. I got to finish this work like this. And then I hear ding, and I look down. There's a question, question mark. <sighs> so I grab that phone. I'm the lion tamer in my cage. I call her like this, and I'm like, hey, did you just text me? She goes, yeah, it's just checking. We got the whole evening. The kids are gone. There's nothing here. I just want to make sure we get dinner together tonight. I went, ugh, I am such a jerk. (laughs) I didn't tell her that. I'm like, oh, honey, that's so sweet. I'm looking forward to dinner, right? So she was just enthusiastic that she gets to spend time with me. She wasn't being grumpy about the fact that I was working. She's enthusiastic, and I should thus be enthusiastic that we get to spend time together. But... There's no tone to a text. So what was going on in my head? I'm a little frustrated. I'm tense. I, can, I can't solve this problem in front of me. I read this text. What do you mean by that? When are you coming home? Question mark. <laughs> See what happens? Dude, we have gotten in a habit of trying not to engage personally and physically. And so we communicate and we hurt ourselves, we hurt relationships, we hurt other people, when we never intended to, but we don't know what's going on in their heads either, right? And especially when we pretend like we're trying to, or when we really are trying to pr- repair broken relationships, so we try to do that with texted words. 90 some odd percent of all communication is visual and audio, it's not ver- just the words, so I would encourage you, man, as, as, you, as you're going forward, if you've got something that really needs to be confronted, the good or the bad, the hard or the easy, right, the beneficial or the, or the, or the difficult, don't do the, those things by typing. Hey, hey, we have Zoom. We've got FaceTime. Do that. Make a phone call at least. Let them hear the fact that you're choosing a peaceful tone, not a sarcastic tone, right? Uh, those things all matter. And we could really, really help the world around us and the people around us by speaking the truth in love and demonstrating it in a personal way that they can trust, right? We tend to be down on what we're not up on. We tend to distrust those things we don't know or we're not exactly sure what's because we're, we're hardwired to protect ourselves from pain, right? So we think they're going to hurt us. We think they mean something mean, and it might not be that way. And so learn to communicate face to face. And then as I've been talking, you know, about prejudging or I was talking about, you know, being guessing what my daughter meant or guessing what my wife meant, we tend to do that. When we see a problem, when we see a person who's going through life and they, they clearly have some struggles or some issues in their life, we tend to fill in the gaps. We just guess. I bet they're a drug addict. I bet, I bet they're really bad with money. I bet they're whatever, right? We, we, we tend to sometimes just fill in the gaps instead of finding out what their story is. So we're getting ready to do baptisms in two weeks. As a matter of fact, the Jimmy John's is a big deal, man. If you haven't yet been uh, followed the Lord and believers' baptism, God public with your faith, the fact that you've embraced the faith uh, for yourself, this is the time. I believe this is your time. One of the reasons why I love to do this is because and be a part of it is because it just represents so much 
changed lives. So many changed lives. And every, sto- every person up there has a name. And every name has a story. Every story matters to God. One of my favorite stories from one of our recent baptisms was uh, uh, when we baptized Neve and then f- later on find out so much about his life and uh, what God was doing. I think it would be easy. Maybe he had some of his own struggles that he was going through. And instead of judging him, somebody here in this room extended grace And they stopped to help, showing Jesus love. And it literally changed his life. That's what brought him to Jesus, was somebody chose not to fill in the blanks, or not to guess, but to actually get engaged on a human level. I love what God's doing in Neve's life, and I think you will too. Check out this video. My name is Neve Knowles. I grew up on the east side of Detroit. I was born in 2004. And I was instantly given to my grandmother because my parents didn't have the capacity or the ability to take care of me at the time. 2009, she died. When I went back with my parents, my siblings didn't really understand me or know me. My mom was the one that took all of us in. My dad just kind of drifted to the side. When they broke up, it was just a lot of moving back and forth between them. Moved up like 22 times in my life. I just never really felt like I had a stable place to call home. I just felt really alienated, being around a lot of negative situations and people that God definitely never wanted me around. By this time, I was 17, and that's when I started to become a man, and I was working a lot. The only peace that I really had during these times when I was feeling lost in my relationships and just lost in life, doing bad in school, I would lean towards skateboarding and just exercise. I finally started to understand my emotions and understand my past traumas and why I felt the way I felt growing up as a child. And I was building a new version of myself to take all the pain of my old self, but it it just, I just still wasn't strong enough. It was a random evening in November in in 2022. And I was just at a point where I, I reached an emotional breaking point where it just felt like the walls of my mind were caving in on me and everything was just crashing down. I rode my bike to get to the store, to get to work, to get to the skate park. So I started to go to the skate park. The stress was building up from those bike rides, for real. When I was about halfway there, the sun went down and I took it personally. (laughs) I was so devastated from that one little thing, not being able to do what what I wanted to do. As I was turning around, right in front of me was a bed. It was so surreal because I was literally looking for beds earlier that morning on Facebook Marketplace and realizing I couldn't afford it. I was so stressed out about it. And I felt really relieved in that moment that there was a bed right in front of me and I had no idea how I was gonna get this thing home and make it to work sane the next day. I hadn't even made it to the main road yet and I was fully exhausted and had no idea how I was gonna do it, but I was fully determined to get it home no matter what. And I didn't believe in Jesus at the time, but I started to pray for God to send me someone. At this point, it was about six o'clock. It was rush hour traffic, but I finally hit the first main road. There were so many cars and I didn't know if I could make it over in time without falling in front of one or just being embarrassed. And in that exact moment, this random stranger just pulled up, yelled at me to get in and said he would take me wherever I needed to go and to throw everything in the back. I just couldn't stop thanking him on the way home and he invited me to Heritage Church. And when I came in that Sunday, Jeff Forrester was on stage saying something along the lines of, it's never too late, it's today's your day. Once I accepted Jesus, I had true hope and my life was saved forever. It took me a few seconds to muster up the courage, but I got up and I went and got baptized. And I really felt like Jesus was watching over me the whole time. And I really felt the love of God for the first time in a long time. So from the point when I got baptized on, a lot of joy filled my life. I met a lot of new good people at church, people even outside of church. And I finally got the freedom I was looking for in in Jesus because I realized that I don't have to stress so much and I don't have to worry about everything and I don't have to think about my next move as much because God already has it all laid out for me. I love that. Such a fantastic reminder, right, that all of us have our own stuff. 
And uh, hey, sometimes you just need a bed and you find one on the side of the road, you try to drag it home on your bicycle, and everybody else thinks you're some kind of nut, right? Well, all you need is just somebody to stop and make a human connection rather than take a picture and post it on social media, right? So uh, one of the things I love about Neve, oh, by the way, uh, did you know Neve is heaven spelled backwards? That's how, that, that's his name. Isn't that such a great name? So, uh, you know, his story just reminds us that more importantly, God loves us and he forgives us even with our, our baggage and our issues and he values who we are. God loves you just the way you are, regardless of whether you felt judged by other people or not. Uh, God loves you just the way you are, and he loves you too much to just leave you the way he finds you. By the way, when God comes into your life, he begins to transform you. He begins to change you and make you into the person he always planned for you to be. So if you're still on the fence about baptism, you haven't decided to do that yet, I do believe, just like I mentioned the day that Neve was here, I believe this is your day. I do. I think that this is your moment. So just do it. Don't wait around, right? Go online, sign up today at heritagechurch.com slash Jimmy John's. Somebody will follow up with you. We'll make sure we get your t-shirt, get you all connected with regard to all the, the details and things that are going to happen. And then invite your friends and family. We'll celebrate this amazing change in your life. So this idea of judging, so many people are quick to say, oh, Jesus said don't judge, don't judge, don't judge, don't judge, right? So we're afraid to have an opinion at all anymore uh, because we're afraid that we're judging because everybody demands that we endorse them. So let, let's, let's actually look at what Jesus said. There's some help in that. There's benefit when you just actually look at the original. And so let's look and see what he says. Uh, uh, Matthew chapter 7, verses 1 through 3, Jesus said, do not judge others and you will not be judged. For you will be treated as you treat others. The standard you use in judging is the standard by which you will be judged. Ooh. That's why we shouldn't just judge based on our own opinions, right? Let's let God's word be the standard. How about we leave it there? God's the judge. He's the one. It's his words. Because uh, we don't want it to be opinion. What if somebody else's opinion is different than yours? You judge with your opinion, and they judge back, or God judges with their opinion. How about that? That'd be dangerous. So instead, he says, the standard by which you judge is the standard by which you'll be judged. So why worry about a speck in your friend's eye when you have a log in your own? Isn't that funny? It's such a funny phrase. Jesus rebuking the hypocritical, judgmental attitude that tears others down to build yourself up when you've got your own issues. We've all got our own issues. And so at Heritage, uh, I'm kind of known as the faster pastor. I have a little bit of a a, a lead foot, Uh, just a little. So uh, I'm just in a hurry to get everywhere, right? That's uh, I'm in a hurry. And so uh, it's not uncommon for me to be just zipping down the road, driving probably too fast. I'll be on the freeway. I'm doing 85 miles an hour. And, and, and somebody will pass me doing 87. I'm like, look at that idiot. <laughs> you ever do that? Look at that. You, because you drive the right way, don't you? You drive the right way. And people who drive slower than you, they're cowards. They don't know how to drive. And the morons who drive faster than you, well, they're just looking to die right? But you're the one. You're the one. And so here's literally what Jesus is saying, right? So I'm doing my 85 miles an hour, just going. And I look over at that guy who's doing two miles an hour faster. Shame on him. I come flying past that person who's doing, you know, 70 in a, you know, 70. And I'm like, that person don't even know how to drive. That's what Jesus is saying. But we do it all the time. We do it all kinds of stuff. We do it in marriage. We do it in relationships. We do it with money. We do it all the time. So Jesus is saying, so he's not saying don't have an opinion based on my words. He's not saying don't pay attention to what is true or not true, what is right or wrong. He's not saying that. He's saying be careful about being judgmental when you're walking around with a big old plank in your eye and you're trying to get a little you know, speck out of somebody else's eye. Let's go a little further. Here he goes. He keeps going. He says, how can you think of saying to your friend, let me help you get rid of that speck in your eye when you can't see past the log in your own eye? And then he goes, hypocrite. I didn't say it. Jesus said it. I'm just reading it. He said, hypocrite. First, get rid of the log in your own eye, and then you'll see well enough to deal with the speck in your friend's eye. Isn't it amazing when you take, instead of taking one sentence completely out of context and quote it, don't judge, don't judge, don't judge. Jesus is saying, quit being a hypocrite. Don't judge people for stuff you're doing. That's what he's saying. Isn't that what he's saying? So, so when you take it, that's why the benefit. Let me just tell you, people, it's amazing when you read the Bible. It is. It's incredible. You should try it sometime. When you read the Bible. So, so when somebody says something to me like that, they quote, they'll quote a verse like that, like maybe I'm not familiar with it or something. I'll go, where is that in the Bible? And then they'll go, oh, I don't know. 
So then there's this amazing thing called Google, and you can search, where does it say in the Bible, don't judge, right? Uh, download the version app. It's free. You can put it on your phone, right? It's totally free. It'll read out loud to you if you want it to. It's amazing. But you can just search right there. It's got a search saying, where did Jesus say, judge not, right? And it'll show you the verse. Then you can read the whole chapter. Find out Jesus had a lot more to say than just that. Jesus goes on. He, he just busts in their chops. He's telling, man, you're walking around like, like uh, whited sepulchers. You paint really nice on the outside, make yourself look good, but on the inside, you're full of dead men's bones. Right? What he's talking is challenging them on being hypocrites. That whole passage, that's what he's saying. He's not saying don't, don't differentiate between right and wrong. He's certainly not saying we have to endorse bad behavior. He's not saying that. He's not saying it's judgmental to even say, hey, God says don't do that. What he is saying is, if you're walking around with that big old beam in your eye, don't try to get a little speck out of somebody else's eye. And, and so this really leads us to the, next, the second big issue point that I want to make. We should always consider our own struggles before judging the struggles of others. Does that make sense? Is that consistent with what he says in that whole passage? If you just, instead of reading one verse, judge not that you be not judged, how about we read all four verses there and realize what he's talking about, right? He's talking about being judgmental. We're all broken in some area of our lives. Whenever we address the faults of others, we should always look inward at our own faults and be aware of the fact that we're all sinners. And then there's always that one person in the room who goes, well, not me. I'm a pretty good person, right? We knew you were going to be here today. And so we read this verse, Galatians chapter 6. If, if anyone thinks he's something when he's nothing, he defeat, deceives himself. And that's all I'm going to say about that. So maybe you felt judged by others, or maybe you feel like mostly God's just mad at you and wants to judge you. Can I tell you some good news? Have you ever heard of John 3.16? Sometimes it, like at the Super Bowl or important you know, national championship football game, there'll be somebody in the end zone with a sign, John 3.16. It just says that God loves the world so much that he gave his only son so that everyone who believes in him won't perish but can have eternal life. That's, the, that's John 3.16. John 3.17 says that God did not send Jesus in the world to judge the world, but to save the world through him. So if Christians have made you feel judged, and that's like now your opinion of God, that God's mostly mad at you, God hates sin. He does. But God desperately loves you. Jesus came to rescue you from that. He didn't come to judge you for it. As a matter of fact, here's, so you have to have honest conversations. There has to be truth at the basis of our conversations, or we can't make any progress. So the truth in Romans chapter 3, verse 23 is everybody has sinned. We all miss the mark of God's glorious standard. That's what it says. Everybody. I'm a sinner. You're a sinner. We're all sinners. Kumbaya. Right? We're all sinners. We're all in the same boat. Every one of us is a sinner. That means we, we can't walk around with the big log in our eye and point out the fact that somebody else is a sinner. We, we all have sin. We're all sinners. Romans 6.23 says the wages of sin, the ransom for sin, the cost for sin, the price of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. It's a free gift. That's what it is. God, God didn't come to judge you. God came to rescue you, and he made it as simple as offering a free gift, and all you have to do is receive it. John 1.12 says, to those who believed him and received him, he gave the power to become the children of God, the family of God, to be on the inside. Well, how do you get that? Romans chapter 10 says that if we believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead, and if we declare with our mouth and invite Jesus to be the Lord, the king of our life, then he says, every one who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Romans chapter 10, you can read it. Everyone. So in the original Greek, the word everyone, that we translate as everyone in English, it means um, everyone. That's what it means. It's for Everybody. That person at the end of the row that looks like they're put together and they're church people, good church people, they deserve to be here and God probably really loves them. But if you knew what was in my life, God can't love me or forgive me. You know what? We're all sinners and everyone who invites Jesus to be the Lord, the king of their life can receive that free gift. And so I'm gonna have the band come. They're gonna come and sing a song. Uh, I'm not quite finished with the message. I have just one more thing very, very quickly. I'm going to have them come. They're going to sing a song. And I want you to really pay close attention to the words because it's an invitation to you. It's an invitation for you to receive what Jesus is inviting you to. He's inviting you into his family. He's inviting you to the table. Hear the voice 
Maybe you're that person. Maybe you felt judged. Maybe you thought that God's whole deal was about judging you. He didn't come to judge you. Jesus came to rescue you, to save you. And so I want to invite you to be that person that that song's talking about, where you just come to the table, you experience, receive everything that Jesus has for you, but it requires that we surrender to him. So I'm going to pray. Maybe you pray a prayer like this with me. Maybe you just say, God, I admit that I'm a sinner. I live my life my own way. I believe that Jesus paid the price and he rose again. So Jesus, right now, 
with as much faith as I have, I open my life to you. Would you come in? Would you save me? Would you forgive my sins? Would you settle peace between me and God in eternity? Would you give me power to live every day to become more and more like Jesus, living the Jesus way? Thank you for loving me, Jesus, and thank you for saving me. Amen. 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 Good job. All right. Well, listen, if you're here today and you prayed that prayer, maybe even today for the first time, or, or you've done that recently and you've not yet let us know, would you please text the word trust Jesus, one word, to 94,000? Let us know. We'll send you some links and just point you in the right direction. We'd love to know about that today. Hey, this is the time we're going to worship together in our finance. This is a very important part of worship, as we have been doing. Uh, I'd love to read for you 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse number 7. It reads this way. It says, Each of you should give what you've decided to give in your heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And it's just one of the thousands of verses that talks about our posture of giving back to what God has blessed us with. And so we're always careful to say thanks for trusting us, but more importantly, what God says as well. And uh, by the way, you can give safe and securely with the, uh, the uh, Heritage app or online. Or if you're online, you can click the button give. Or if you come prepared to drop something in, you can do it at the kiosks at one of the doors on the way out. But again, thank you for doing that. And then finally, I just want to remind you that uh, July 16th, coming up next week, there is a class called uh, 101, and it is basically like uh, Heritage 101 Unpack. If you want to know how this place operates, if you want to know what we believe, what we're built on, what our strategy is, and what your first steps are, then sign up for this. And it's going to be a class that, you know, it's going to take place during the, I think, the 1030 hour next week. And you can go to heritagechurch.com slash events and sign up for that. And then uh, other than that, I just want to say thank you so much for being here. And hopefully we'll see you next week as we wrap up the series. God bless you. And we'll see you then.